Okay, so the bus is ready. I hope you're all packed to go to uh, Hatusa. Where are we going? Right there, where the arrow is, below that you see uh, the Turkish name of the former Hittite capital, the modern Turkish name, Boasköy. And in parentheses, you see next to it Hatusa. Uh, that is the Hittite name of the capital. You see it is pretty north within what we call central Anatolia, the modern day Republic of Turkey. Let's drive to Boaske, or Boaskale as it's called nowadays. We drive here on the central uh, city square where the, there is a monument with all kinds of highlights uh, of the Hittite capital. They are understandably and rightly proud of the, that they are hosting, so to speak, that they are the site of the former Hittite capital. And let's move on immediately. There is our bus uh, to the ticket office that you see there. Uh, if anybody needs uh, the restroom, this is your last chance. And uh, so let's follow the road. Uh, we can walk, some can take the bus, whatever you prefer. And let me first give you some information on the Hittite capital as a whole. And then we will really start the tour. So as you maybe can already see from this map of Boaske, Hatusha, you see it, the names, both of them in the uh, left uh, corner at the bottom, is one of the largest ancient capitals. It, is, it covers two square uh, kilometers. If my conversion is correct, that should be something like 500 acres, but you can correct me if, if I'm uh, wrong later on. Uh, so it is a very large site. The total circumference of the walls, uh, so here from the north all the way down to the south, is 4.2 miles. So that's a huge area that it covers. And there's also a very interesting difference in height. Uh, you can already see that uh, by the name. So here, this lower part, we call the upper city because the city reaches its highest point right here where numbers 17 and 18 are. And then it goes down and reaches its lowest point right here, which therefore we call the lower city. The next slide that you see here uh, is, gives you two different things. On the left hand, you see the occupation phases of the Hittite capital in history. Actually, the oldest traces of human habitation in the area date to the late 6th millennium BC, so it's very, very old. And that was right here, but that is not on this map. This map starts with at the end of the 3rd millennium, so let's say 22, 2100 BC, uh, this was inhabited by Anatolians. Then at the start of the 2nd millennium, let's say from 1900 to 1700, Anatolian, uh, sorry, Assyrian merchants set up a trading network and they started living also in Khatush, as they called it, uh, and they lived there while the population was right here. Then in the old Hittite period, the old kingdom, uh, that is this uh, map here, um, the, uh, this was the extent of the city. And so then we're talking about, let's say 1650 into the, until maybe 1500 or a little bit later even. And then in probably the second half of the 16th century, uh, there was an enormous activity, an important moment in the history of the Hittite kingdom. And they uh, added to the city this entire Southern extension. And this is what the city covered in uh, when it went down around 1200. Important is the other map, which shows you one of the reasons why the, what we later call the Hittites, why they chose this as a good site 
uh, for their capital. All those little triangles, as you can see below, uh, note water sources, water availability, as, is, as it says there in the caption. So uh, the city is well provided with water, which was, of course, extremely important. Okay, I always like this drawing. It's a very old drawing. It may go back to the 50s or 60s, but it shows you nicely the difference in height between the the southern tip that I just showed you on that other map. This is where the city reaches its highest point, and you can see it gradually going down until it's re the city reaches its lowest point in what we call the lower city, where we have uh, the Great Temple, which we will visit today. The city also has, at several points, rock outcroppings that were used for uh, to put buildings on in the Hittite period. There is one here, Buyukaya, as you can see the Turkish name there. There is, of course, the very famous one that we will visit together this afternoon. This is where the elite lived, Buyukale, as it's called in Turkish. And there are some others here in this area, more in the west, also rocky outcroppings right in the middle of the city. But you see the high difference, and I think the difference between the lower city, the lowest point, the temple right there, and the highest point there is somewhere between two and three hundred meters. So you can imagine that is that's quite a difference in, in height. Okay, let's first take an air balloon or, or hang on to a drone and have a look at the city, what it looks like from the air. First of all, we start at, you saw the map, the southern point where the city is reaches its highest point, that is right here. Then you can already see it going down, sliding down. There are, you can maybe recognize, we will see them later, some temples here. Uh, this is Buyukale, where the king and queen lived and the ruling elite. This is that rock outcropping Buyukaya, where the earliest uh, habitation was. And here we go down to the temple and the lower city. If we go down a little bit and let's say standing here we turn around and look to the south to this highest point this is what you see and note especially this artificial literally artificial horizontal line by which you can recognize the capital already from miles away uh, when we drove our bus up to Hatusha, we saw it at a distance, this horizontal line. It's very characteristic. Now let's go to the other point. Now we are in the north and we look in southern direction. Here again you have that horizontal line of the where the Sphinx gate is, which we will see later on. This is that rock Buyukaya, which I mentioned earlier. And here we have the uh, Buyukale, the Acropolis where the ruling elite lived. And here you look down into the lower city at the uh, temple complex of Temple One. This is what the city might have looked like in the old days. This is of course an artistic uh, rendering with guards or campfires uh, lit on top of the bastions. So we are still at that ticket office and I think it's time we go in. And right there we see, in on the left, we see already some uh, stone foundations. And these are actually foundations of the original walls. And you may remember, as I said in the beginning, there were some four over four miles of walls surrounding the city. What did these walls look like? Because here we only see the foundations. Now here, this from the Chorum Museum, they have a very uh, interesting uh, model of how the walls worked. First, we have a stone foundation of big solid stones. And on top of it, uh, there is a timber structure filled with mud bricks, as you can see there. Now, of course, over time, uh, the, the wood of the timber structure and those mud bricks, they gradually crumbled. And so what you normally see when you visit the Hittite capital are these, simply the stone foundations. 
Um, and that's also true for all, not only the walls, but also all buildings. Here you see one of the temples in the upper city, uh, close to this highest point. And what we see is simply here you see the stone foundations and the whole buildup of timber and mud brick has uh, disappeared over the millennia. However, we can form sort of a picture of what the bastions and the walls look like by this clay model of a Hittite wall. Uh, this used to be the rim of a large vase and it's they used as a decoration uh, the city walls and bastions and this was then used in the early 2000s by the uh, archaeologists to do a piece of archaeological experiment and they built, they reconstructed completely according to the old Hittite uh, building methods, they built this 60 yard, 60 meter uh, stretch of Hittite walls. This is what it should have looked like. Here you see again the ticket office where we were. So we've gone a little bit back to look at these walls. They look very impressive. And this picture exactly gives you a beautiful impression also of how rocky, how mountainous the city is and the differences in height. Here again, do you see this horizontal line? That is again the southernmost and highest point of the city with the Sphinx Gate, a little opening, the Sphinx Gate in between. We will come there. And at night, if they light it up, it may look, or it looks like this, very romantic. Here you can see how they did it. They used indeed the old foundations that were, that were, were the only things left of the old walls. And on top of it, they built, they reconstructed what it looked like. Here you, we are on top of the wall and we look at the side of one of the bastions. And here actually you, you see just the left arm of the present director of excavations at Hatusha, Professor Andreas Schachner from Germany, but he lives in Istanbul at the uh, German Archaeological Institute. So, okay, uh, here is, uh, again, the capital. We were, that stretch of wall is right here where it says number two. Let's now go down the road. We take a left and let's go to the temple right here. Temple one, as we usually know it. Here you see a, a map. This is the temple itself. You enter here where it says five, you enter a courtyard, and then at the end there are two rooms that are usually interpreted as the the cellae, the cellae, where the, sta the statues of the two gods, maybe the storm god and the sun goddess, stood. And all this is surrounded, as you can see, by, uh, let's say, service buildings, uh, store rooms, Whereas the temple uh, was only one story, these storerooms may have had multiple stories. Here on the right, you can sort of see a model what it may have looked like, perhaps without these colors. In red, you have the actual temple and the storerooms in yellowish or whatever color it is uh, around it. We, let's say we came in, the Hittites came in through this gate followed the street and then went around just like we did and then enter the temple complex and then take a right and go right in. These gates were of course very important meeting points where the Hittites themselves controlled who came in, who came out and the same goes for all goods and services that went out and that came in. And you can see this, for example, exemplified in this drawing that I always like. Here are Hittites. There's a Hittite official uh, sitting here asking this old man, what are you coming for? He brought his son or a servant or a slave carrying something that he wants to bring. And there's a scribe here sitting with his stylus, writing a tablet, doing administration. And you see how all these uh, Hittite guards, here's one too, how they look at the man and how they uh, may be somewhat suspiciously even. Okay, let's take our drone again and look at what it looks like from above. 
you, uh, so we were coming in, sorry, here, uh, you enter the, the temple into the courtyard, and then here are these cellae. Around the temple is a street, and you recognize on either side of the temple and also here, these storerooms. Uh, note here, uh, some pithoi, some uh, storage, huge storage vases that are largely sunk in the ground in which they kept maybe oil and other uh, goods. And I should also tell you that right here in these rooms, that's where they found the largest collection of Hittite tablets when they started excavating in the beginning of the 20th century. Here you see some entrances to uh, stone slabs, thresholds into storerooms. Note the dowel holes uh, that they use to fix, to, to build up the upper structure. Again, all of timber and mud brick. And here you see on the left, the, the street surrounding the temple. This is still the, the Hittite pavement that you see here. And here, two of those pithoi, those huge storage vases, vases still stuck in the ground there. And you sh certainly should also have a look uh, when you walk around it at the amazing craftsmanship of the Hittite stone masons. The Hittites were known as stonemasons, and you can see here how neatly they fit together, made fit together, uh, these huge stones, uh, each weighing tons. They move them, they, they adjust them exactly so that they would fit like this. You cannot even put a piece of paper uh, between the seams. Here is another spot where they beautifully fit together. Somewhere in the storerooms, there is also the famous green stone. It is indeed as green and very smooth feeling as it is here on the photo. Here is a Turkish guide irreverently sitting on the green stone. Many legends have been woven around this green stone about magic functions and so forth. And uh, the archaeologists, I think, uh, assure us that this is not the original uh, place. But where it came from and what its function was, we don't really know. The temple, of course, was also the place where, as in other temples, a lot of ceremonies happened. Uh, you can see here a king uh, and a queen standing before an altar, and behind the altar on a pedestal is a statue of the storm god in the shape of a bull. Those Hittite cultic ceremonies, they were accompanied by all kinds of festivities. Here you see uh, an acrobat or maybe two acrobats doing a stunt with a ladder. Here we have a sword, solo, a, a sword swallower, all part of the entertainment for, first of all, the gods, but I guess the people enjoyed it as well. And then you see similarly here people somersaulting in the air. There's a lot of music, a lyre or a harp that's being played. Here a very big harp. Here someone is carrying kind of a guitar-like instrument. So there was lots of life, sound, and no doubt also smells from the offerings uh, going around. Now, as you saw, we only have the stone foundations. That's all we have. Everything, has, everything else has crumbled. But no doubt, uh, these temples and their statues were painted in brightly primary colors. And we have a little bit of a glimpse of what buildings may have looked like on the inside from these pieces of plaster that you see here. So no doubt from the inside, they were very lively, beautiful, and colorful. So let's leave the temple and go on our way. We will walk down this road, then go to the left, uh, yes, to the left, pass some uh, grain silos here that are dug into the ground, and we will find our way to the Acropolis Buyukale, as you see it here. Some have taken the bus, as you see, others have been walking, and here before us rises 
the Acropolis where the ruling elite spent most of their time. Um, the stairs that you see here is modern. The original entrance was through a ramp of which you again only see the foundations here. The ramp brought them straight up to uh, the top of the Acropolis, but there were also side, there was a side entrance somewhere here. Okay, let's climb the stairs, the modern stairs, and uh, see what it looks like. Again, it's best to look at first at it from above. You s we came here, you see that the foundations of the ramp, we took the stairs, we're coming up now, and we are entering this complex of buildings. There are uh, all kinds of them. It was probably a combination of palatial buildings, uh, ceremonial buildings, and administrative buildings, as I will uh, show you, try to show you in this very schematic drawing. So we came, the ramp isn't uh, here, but you will see it in the next slide. So the ramp went like this. We go in here, then through a gate, we enter the lower courtyard. And it's this building that we hydatologists call building A, where, which was the second largest find spot of Hittite tablets. So this must have been some kind of an administrative center of some kind. Then we take this gate, we reach the middle court, and behind there, there is an upper court. Now, usually we assume that these two buildings, known as E and F, were, let's say, the private chambers, the private uh, rooms of the king and the queen and the royal family. They had a wonderful uh, view into the lower city. Here you have that rocky outcropping of uh, Buyukaya again. This is the largest building, was the largest building on top of the Acropolis, which we usually reconstruct as a kind of an audience hall where the king would receive foreign embassies. And the others are a mixture of, as I said, administrative religious buildings uh, and so forth. Here you get kind of a rendering of what it may have looked like. Here you see the ramp. Here are the two horses and the chariot of the king. Here in white you see the king himself. He has descended from his chariot and he's walking into the city following a procession that goes right here through the lower court and through the gate here into the uh, middle court. There's somebody here at an altar on the roof of a building. You see the smoke going up into the air, doing, uh, making an offering. And somebody in a donkey here, and there are some people running out of the side entrance to the Acropolis. And so let's suppose we are the king and queen. This is the view they had, but then with everything nicely built up, of course. Here you recognize again the temple which we just visited and the storerooms uh, surrounding it. And what I forgot to mention is that behind it here, beyond the storerooms, are residential areas and workshops. Okay, so we come from Buyukala. Let's now go down this road and have a look at this complex right here. Uh, let's first look at 28 right here where my laser is, uh, number 24. There are two, but one is, uh, I, I'm pointing at the one here. That is a huge pond a cistern for water management for the city. I told you the city, city had a lot of uh, water sources. And what it looked like in antiquity, uh, very schematically, is like this. Here you see that some 24 pond, pond number one. And, but in the corners, they had let in, they had built two yeah, chapels, shrines, chambers. You see the best preserved one on the right there. We will visit it in some detail uh, in a moment. And it looked out uh, at a uh, temple or two temples that you see right here. So what does it look like today? Well, here, so here you must imagine that 
pond all the way going to the left. And here you have that one chamber that was built into the, the dam that kept the water together. And oh, by the way, notice again, you see the highest point of the city, the horizontal line with the Sphinx gate right there, the little opening. Okay, let's walk now toward that shrine, that chapel, whatever it was. You can maybe see uh, here the steel cage that they built around it against, of course, all the tourists. But we have the director of excavations with us and he has a key and he can uh, let us in. And inside we see two reliefs, at least shown here. On the right side, that while we are standing in the shrine here, we have a large inscription in Anatolian hieroglyphs, that is that other script that the Hittites used next to the cuneiform. Cuneiform was for the internal administration, but for monuments, for publicly displayed inscriptions, they used this script that they had developed themselves, and we call them the Anatolian hieroglyphs. They have nothing to do with the Egyptian hieroglyphs, but that's just how we call them. On the other side is probably the king responsible for building this shrine. Um, his name is, because we can read it right here, is Shupiluriuma. However, there's a problem. We have two Shupiluriumas. And although in the beginning we all assumed, oh, this is the second one who is the last known king who reigned about 1200 BC, now we are not so sure anymore. And there are quite a few colleagues and I too tend now towards thinking that this is actually the earlier Shukuduliuma of around 1350 BC, but it is not in any way proven yet. Okay, so let's leave this area and the pond here and continue along the road, down, 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 and we come here at the King's Gate. Okay, why is it called the King's Gate? Because of this figure, of course. And you immediately notice that the color of the stone here is different than that of the rock, uh, rocks on, on either side. That's because this is a replica. The original is in the Ankara Museum, uh, which we should have seen uh, just yesterday or a few days ago. This, and in this case, the wall is fake, but here the relief is real. This is the original. And we see uh, a figure, a man with a pointed helmet with a plume or a tassel hanging down from it. And from under the helmet comes almost as long his own ponytail. Hittites loved ponytails. His left hand is raised in kind of a greeting gesture. Uh, and in his right hand, he holds a beautifully uh, ceremonial axe that kings sometimes carried. In his belt, here you see the hilt of a sword that comes out right here. Uh, he is bare-chested, and I don't have a slide of that, and I apologize, but if you look more closely, you will see that his chest hair is very, in great detail, indicated, and he has so much of it, had so much of it, that one of the first travelers actually thought the man was wearing a fur jacket. He is also wearing a short kilt, uh, as we know it from many other uh, representations of both kings and gods. Look at those forceful knees. And so, yeah, is this a king? Is this a god? We don't know. On his helmet, he has two on either side, but we see only one, of course. A horn that we usually call the horn of divinity, but in later period, kings started using to portray themselves, uh, start portraying themselves also with the horns of divinity. So, um, yeah, this could be either. And for those of you who know the OI, and I'm sure you all do, uh, when the OI was built in 1929, 1930, Breasted, on the north side of the building, so that's the side where also the main entrance is, he put just under the, under the roof, he put five or six 
shields or bosses. There is one showing a menorah. There is one with the tree of life. There is a Phoenician ship. A ship. And he also put there the figure of the king or god of the king's gate from Khatusha. You, it used to be very difficult to see because of the, all the ivy, but now they've taken it out. And next time you visit the OI, you should certainly look for it. It's towards the eastern end of the, of the side. Look at the detail uh, of the king's left hand. You can see his cuticles uh, along his nails. It's all, it, it has a lot of detail. And this, now we look him straight into the one eye. He comes out of the stone. His face comes out of the stone more than halfway. And he smiles very benevolently as we leave the city, maybe wishing us well. That is the king of the king's gate. Now we have left with his blessing. We have gone through the gate chamber and we have now left the city for a brief moment and we turn around and we look at this arch as it originally was, marked by the incision that you can follow on either side. And this is how we reconstruct it. And this shape is very typical for the Hittites, for Hittite architecture. Actually, this gate and the other gate that we will see, the Lion Gate, had this shape. And we also just saw it in this chapel, if you remember. And I'm always struck, those among you who have been to Barcelona uh, may uh, remember the Palau Güey made by uh, Antoni Gaudí, uh, the Palacio Güey, you can also say, which has, especially if you look here on the right, which gives you the exact same parabolic shape. Uh, very beautiful, I think. So what did such a gate look like? Here you see a rendering of the gate. Uh, this is the actual gate with the parabolic shape as we saw it. Two bastions on either side, of course, at least one guide keeping us from entering. Uh, and it's Interesting to see if you look at this structure that is built in front of it, you cannot enter straight into the city. No, they force you as a visitor to come parallel to the wall and then you have to make a left and go in if he lets you. This is of course a defensive measure. Uh, if there were enemies that were trying to enter, you could easily assail them from above, from the walls, throw all kinds of nasty things on them in the hope that they would give up and leave. Okay, so we are now at the outside of the King's Gate. Let's walk on the outside along the wall. We are missing here Temple 5, which was no doubt a very important temple. But we move towards what is called here Yerkapı in modern Turkish. 1718, this is where the Sphinx Gate is. Here you see it again. You've seen this picture before. Uh, we are now sort of standing just around the corner here. And this, you see here this pyramidal, pyramid-like uh, glacis that went, of course, all the way. The Hittites had built originally one set, one line of bastions and walls there, but in the 13th century apparently there was a lot of uncertainty and fear and they built a second wall right in front of it, probably using uh, getting their building material from the glacis here, which is why uh, that's no longer filled up. Note, by the way, how going down, as I already said before, you see the remains, the foundations of several temples. Here you have the Acropolis that we have uh, visited, Buyukaya, and we came all the way from here, from the temple. But okay, now we are here and we want to go up. There were originally two stairs, one on this side and one on that side, but the Hittites, by building that second wall in front of it blocked the stairs. So they were no longer usable. But we can. Here you see that about 30 meter high stone work. Uh, there's somebody on top of it. And here you see the stairs that leads right up. It's a very impressive sight. There we go. 
climbing, working our way up. Look at those huge stones. And finally, there as a reward, there awaits us the Sphinx, because of which we call it the Sphinx Gate. It's pretty damaged. Look at how nicely, again, it fits into the foundation here. Sphinx is, has a lion's body, a human head, and it had a hairdo right on top. You can maybe still, uh, but you will see them in a moment more clearly, those rosettes on top of its head. Only this one is preserved. We enter the, the gate, the actual gate building, and we come out on the other side. Here is now for you to see the current director of excavations, Professor Andreas Schachner. And here you see two sphinxes also on the inside. This is the one on the left, and here only not, not very well visible, the one on the right. These are copies because this one used to be in the Berlin Museum, but a few years ago they had to give it back to Turkey, and now the two sphinxes are reunited, and you can admire them in the Istanbul Museum. Look at the beautiful profile here of the notes, the big ears, which are very characteristic of Hittite uh, depictions of human beings here, too. Huge ears. Okay, so we just, so we are now inside the city somewhere here. Uh, you see here a drawing of that whole structure, but you also see here these lines, and they indicate what, uh, what is a postern, a poterne, as they call it in German. If you are outside, you see it clearly marked the end of the tunnel. And here you see a cross section. There is indeed a 70 meter long tunnel uh, that you can walk through. It has this triangular shape. You see the two walls right, built right on top of it. And at the very beginning of our tour, I told you that this height where the city reaches its highest point is an artificial height. The Hittite engineers uh, took the earth, the, the, the material from here and flipped it over on here to create this artificial hill. This tunnel is still fully usable here. It looks very nice lit now, but in reality, if you go in on either side, at first it is pitch dark, and you have to give yourself a few moments to get used to the darkness coming out of the, the sun. But then you see the light at the end of the tunnel, and you can start walking sort of, I think, two persons side by side can comfortably walk uh, through it. It's really an engineering masterpiece. Okay, we are nearing the end of our tour. We have walked through the tunnel. Uh, we are back in the city again. We pass some other cisterns, and we briefly stop here at number 15 uh, before we go to the Lion Gate. Number 15 is called in Turkish Yeni Cekale. Uh, no, we first take a look whilst we are still standing there at those temples right there in the upper city, but you have already seen them a few times, so let's move on. Here we have Yeni Cekale, and um, you s here you see it's one of those rock outcroppings. Uh, you can maybe also recognize the stones built by the Hittites on top of it to, to serve as the, the foundation of a building. And here you can see what it might have looked like in antiquity. So we walk around it, uh, and here you see the end of our tour. That is the Lion Gate. So let's walk there. And first, we look again at the amazing masonry work. See how tightly everything fits together. Then we take a few steps to the right, and there is the Lion Gate. The, this line is very much damaged, as you can see. It used to be a little bit bigger than the one on the right, but this one is very well preserved. You can still make out the tongue that he is sticking out at us. And if you look carefully, you can see some, uh, not very well, but you can see uh, incisions here. Uh, so they detailed the sculptures detailed the, the manes of the, of the lion. And you can also see his, his nails and 
claws or whatever you call them uh, on a lion. Look again at the parabolic structure of the gate and we enter the gate building and uh, much to our relief, there is the bus again. And I think you are all uh, by now uh, longing for a drink or a snack. Uh, you can get a, a Hittite pide uh, or you can buy for the people who stayed back home some Hittite jewels or a refreshment at a Hittite cafe. And I want to thank at the end you all for sticking out with me and to Matt for making this possible. And I also thank Talia, Lisa, Richard Beal, and Joanne Skurlock for some of the photos. Thank you so much. For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu slash member.